Okay, I'm sitting here with Darmit O'Connell, VP of Business Development uh, at Tesla. Uh, first, let's say, what is your background? Um, my background uh, is broadly in marketing and uh, technology. I've, I've been involved in startups for some time. I've uh, got a bit of a diverse background. I've also done management consulting, but immediately prior to Tesla, I was serving in the U.S. government as chief of staff for political military affairs under Secretary Powell. Ah, Powell. So you have the political thing, educational, educational startup software. Yeah, uh, a, an early attempt to do good and do well at the same time, a, a virtual classroom software. Uh, unfortunately, a little bit too early because the broadband infrastructure wasn't out there, but it was a good start. Yeah, that's what we need. And then also you uh, worked for Coca-Cola? Yeah, some time ago uh, I did uh, marketing for Coca-Cola in developing markets, um, Eastern Europe, uh, Latin America, that sort of thing. Wonderful. So, okay, you have all the backgrounds, political and uh, political startup and big marketing machine. And then, so how did you get into Tesla? Well, actually, while well, I was spending time uh, in the government and focused on the uh, the, the wars uh, in the uh, uh, in the Near East or in the Middle East, um, I got focused on the reasons why uh, we were in those uh, areas, so invested in those areas, and it came back to uh, our dependence on oil, foreign oil, in the U.S. economy, and but this is also true in in Europe and in, in China as well. But uh, and the, the the places that that, that takes one um, and. Uh, uh, as I studied the issue of oil and where it's used and how it's used, it comes back inexorably that it's used in transportation, that overwhelmingly it's used in passenger cars. And so uh, I started thinking about how one would uh, address this uh, fundamental issue. I uh, went back to California from Washington, D.C. and was very fortunate to find Tesla, which at the time was a very small project, a relatively small project in its first couple of years. Of in the rocket factory? No, no, no. It was never co-located uh, in with SpaceX in Los Angeles. It was always in Northern California, always focused in the Palo Alto area. Um, there were about uh, 50 of us at the time. Uh, so this is about seven and a half years ago. Uh, we had a prototype of the vehicle uh, in the time of our first vehicle, the Tesla Roadster. In the time since, we uh, developed and produced and sold uh, the Tesla Roadster. We uh, funded and developed, uh, engineered, uh, and began to manufacture the Model S. We're now selling the Model S uh, broadly in the U.S., now in Europe, and soon in China. So we're on our way. Sounds like a roller coaster ride uh, to go from 50 people to 3,000. And uh... that is definitely true. It's also uh, the next best thing to crazy starting a car company. But uh, it's been a, it's been a ton of fun and. Uh, and what keeps what's kept uh, all this going is a is a strong source of a strong sense of mission. Uh, what we're trying to do broadly, besides make and sell great cars, is to catalyze a, a broad market for elect electric vehicles, a mass market for electric vehicles throughout the world, mm -hmm. um, by offering the best possible technology ourselves and our own branded vehicles, and uh, and by stimulating competition. We're going to succeed. In one way, if we build a great car company and we sell a lot of our own cars, but we're going to succeed in a big way uh, if we uh, if we attract others into this market in order to in order to sell their own EVs in order to push this technology forward. That's already happening in some ways uh, with uh, some of our other competitor brands uh, offering vehicles uh, of more limited capability. Uh, but the the important point is that it's starting, and uh, and that's the most promising aspect of I think of the the most promising of all the effects that we've had in the market. Yeah. It was pretty clear strategy. You start with a high-end sports car, then you make a very nice uh, luxury car, and then you basically go to the generation three. We'll come to that later. But what did you learn from uh, building the Roadster? What was really hard and what was uh, a lot, uh, what, was, uh, what was smoother than you thought? Well, you know, we, we, we were a small company at the time and we thought it would be overly ambitious to engineer and manufacture our own car. And so we went out uh, and we worked with a vehicle that had already been developed, a chassis system that had already been developed. Uh, uh, we took the chassis system from the Lotus Elise and we refashioned the car around it. But uh, one of the things we learned was that the process of converting something that wasn't designed to be specifically, you know, designed as a system, as an electric vehicle, was challenging and expensive and limiting and, uh, and been working with outside partners uh, on key things that you're dependent on you really constrain your, your freedom of action. So uh, it was very liberating for us to be able to uh, move to our second car, the Model S, to expand our volume, to get to a cheaper price point. That was always the intention. Um, but to be doing it ourselves, to con be controlling our own destiny, and to be optimizing the drivetrain proven in the Roadster 
for the Model S and in so doing to prove to the world what a great electric vehicle designed from the ground up could be. Uh, most other electric vehicles in the market, or all others until recently, the BMW, uh, uh, the most recent BMW offering, were essentially conversions uh, of, other, uh, of other vehicles. The, uh, the, GM, the GM Volt, uh, sorry, the Chevy Volt, the Opel Ampera, that's, uh, that comes off the Chevy Cruze chassis. The Nissan Leaf comes off the, um, I'm sorry, the Versa chassis. Um, so these are vehicles which are, I mean, they're very, they're, they're nice, they accomplish the Out of the box, they're limited yeah, by the original they, design. They were, never they were never wholly designed to be electric vehicles. Okay. So you liberated yourself and designed everything yourself up to the, uh, up to the manufacturing software. Huh? I mean, that, even that detail, you started to do your own. Yeah, I mean, I credit, uh, I credit Elon uh, Musk, our CEO, who's got a lot of experience with this stuff. I mean, we, you know, some of the stuff that we do, especially in software, it's, it's, it's natural for a Silicon Valley-based company to do that. I mean, we, we have access to some of the best software uh, engineers in the world, so why wouldn't you develop your own software for, for the vehicle, so too for manufacturing if necessary? We don't wholly reinvent the world. We're very pragmatic about the things that we do. We're very vertically integrated, but we don't do everything ourselves for the sake of doing everything ourselves. We do it for business reasons, either to control our own destiny, to, to control our cost, to improve our quality. It's these sorts of things that drive our behavior. So, because I mean, a lot of Mercedes stuff can be recognized, uh, right, from the car, from uh, the Model S. You know, everything from the steering wheel. I mean, a lot of details are from Mercedes. Actually, I, I would I would uh, contest that point. Really, only the steering only the steering wheel is uh, it's only the steering wheel that comes from uh, uh, from Mercedes. Uh, the steering column, actually, the rest of it is all custom design. There are, there are, there are a couple of switch panels and so forth, but. Uh, but that's small stuff. The most important part of the vehicle, um, the, the, and 99% of the vehicle, uh, is all of our uh, produced by us. It's the chassis system, it's the body system, it's the full powertrain system, it's the firmware, it's the software, it's the 17 and a half inch user. And that is because the whole car industry with the thousands of thousands of companies who make details everywhere, they are all engineered around explosion motors, engines, and not because of electricity? No, I mean, you can reasonably source a number of components from the supply, from the automotive supply chain. Um, you know, we don't make every element of that vehicle. For instance, we don't, we don't manufacture glass. We don't manufacture rubber for tires. Mm -hmm. So there are parts that you can take out of the existing supply chain. Um, but the key value-added components, uh, the ones that we're focused on, the drivetrain, the software components, and that sort of thing, yeah, the, the battery, of course, uh, these are the things that it's important for us to develop. Um, in order to, uh, to preserve our leadership. Uh, it's also the area where one can uh, earn the most value for one's efforts. I mean, you're not, going to, you're not going to change the world or fundamentally change the economics of your business by uh, developing a new rear view uh, mirror. Uh, that just, there's not much of a play in that, right? But if you do the hard stuff, if you do the battery, if you do the motor, then there's a business opportunity. And fundamentally, at the end of the day, while we're very mission oriented, we have to be very business-like. And uh, that's reflected in the fact that we focus our activities on the things where uh, we're going to be most successful from a business perspective so that we can survive and continue to do th things we want to do. You referred to our business model. Our business model is very pragmatic. It was, it's, it's like developing the cell phone or the personal computer, right? It's, you start with a low volume, expensive niche offering because that's where technology starts. Uh, you move to a mid-volume, mid-price, which is what the Model S is, and then you get ultimately get to... Um, a high volume, low price offering, and it's economies of scale that let you get there. It's improving the technology along the way, but this is a con this is a, a well trodden path. And, and path now it's really now you're at a point that it's really hard to buy one. Everybody has to wait and that kind of stuff. I mean, people just are completely crazy about it. What do you do as business development? How do you prepare for the next uh, for the next step? You know, for the the, the model, the, the generation free or something like that. What do you do as a business development VP? <laughs> yeah, well, I would well, first of all, I don't want to leave any of your audience with the impression that it's hard to buy a Model S. It's it's very easy to buy a Model S. Uh, wonderful, you go to TeslaMotors.com and then you fill out and then you wait. Uh, yeah, but the, the wait is is uh, is part of fun. Yeah, part of the fun, but it's not more than two months. We try and. We try and keep. Uh, oh, well, in Holland, it's April, May. Oh, April to May, but it's getting it's getting better. Um, as we, you know, we only started uh, delivering cars in Europe in August, and, and and I hear that we already have over we'll have over a thousand in the Netherlands before the end of the year. So, 
We're making progress. We're scaling up. So sure. it gets quicker. So you don't, I don't want to leave people with the impression it takes a year to get a car. It doesn't. That would, be, that would not be in our interest to, to do that. So business development, it does. I mean, business development is sort of a catch-all phrase for a lot of activities. And those activities include our relationships with companies like Daimler, companies like Toyota. We've done full drivetrain systems for some of their cars. We've got, uh, we're doing a full drivetrain system for the Mercedes B-Class, which is coming out this year. That's very exciting. We do that sort of stuff. Uh, we've got the uh, supercharger rollout uh, around the around the world. Um, well, around the world. Thanks. We have two in Holland. So um, on my way to Berlin, I had to wait somewhere in Hanover four hours. But uh, to Munich, I now I can now just drive without a problem. So thank you for that. Yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be driving uh, to uh, to a ski holiday uh, in a couple of days um, from Amsterdam down to uh, uh, Verbier. So that's good. We have another car going out to uh, Saint Anton. So. Holidays uh, from the Netherlands, very easy. Uh, so Supercharger Network, we've got uh, a number of other activities. Uh, we're opening uh, China right now, and uh, so I've spent a lot of time in China this past year. We have a store that's open in Beijing now, and that's very exciting. I think yeah. the cars are twice as expensive there because of tax reasons, and you have to pay $41,000 to reserve a car. Why is that, and why are the Chinese doing that anyway? Well, it's always been the case that for our first tranche of uh, what we call our founder series, uh, that they were a relatively expensive uh, as far as the deposit was concerned, and over the course of time that deposit goes down. Yep. But the first number of vehicles are valuable, and so you have the opportunity to charge uh, a little bit more for them, and, and we're not unlike any other car company in that regard. The cars are more expensive in China <coughs> than in Europe because there's a very punishing uh, import duty, and, and uh, we have to unfortunately pass that on to the customer. Our principle around the world is actually to maintain uh, price parity, taking into account things like, uh, like subsidy and, uh, and import tax and so forth. So they are more, uh, apparently more expensive in China, and that's unfortunate, but that too will change uh, over the course of time, I'm sure. We'll, we'll be working with the Chinese government, I hope, uh, to figure out how to uh, optimize uh, for the tariff structure. Uh, but we're really excited about, um, about our position there. We've had a lot of um, early interest and uh, we're hoping to build on that. Yeah. Well, also the fact that you can now drive a car in China if you have an electric one, and otherwise you have a lottery, which is really very difficult to get a uh, license plate, will help, uh, will help business for Tesla. Um, let me ask you, um, how, uh, how is you basically assemble the cars in the Netherlands? How are we doing as a logistical country and as a country to do business in? Well, I mean, we're, we wouldn't be here if you guys didn't have... Uh, if yeah, but I mean, you build it and then you had to basically experience how it was. Now you have a little bit of experience. Uh, yeah, no, it's... Uh, all of our hopes uh, so far have been uh, fulfilled. Uh, we've had a great reception here in the Netherlands from the, from the home government, from the city of Amsterdam. Uh, the operation in Tilburg is, is humming along. It's very nice. Uh, it's expanding. That's good. Uh, and, uh, and you've got fantastic port and distribution facilities. You're right in the heart of Europe, even though you're on the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great place for us to launch our business. So we're very happy to be here. Now, the big step for all of us is, uh, of course, go beyond the Model S and go to this third generation. Mm -hmm. What does Tesla need to do to, to move to a price level which is even half, you know, starts at half the original price of, of, uh, of the Model S? What, what do you need to do? That is an unbelievable big, big task. Well, part of the answer is just in volume, right? I mean, uh, when we were buying parts for the Roadster program, you know, we were going to build 2,500 units of those. Every nut and bolt that we bought that was common to a, a Chevrolet was costing us 20 times as much as it cost GM, right? Um, we improved the economics vastly with the Model S, building those at 20 to 40,000 units a year. But when you go to 200,000 units a year, you get much better pricing. You yeah. get much better economies of scale from your supplier network. So that's the big thing. As far as the economics of the powertrain are concerned, and principally the battery, um, the improvements in energy density and the parallel improvements in cost, the lower cost per, per unit of energy stored, are such that um, the, uh, the, the targets we've set for ourselves are very achievable in the three to four years uh, that we're looking at to develop the vehicle and get it on the road. So. Uh, really, it's just a matter of resourcing the effort right now. I mean, this year is devoted to uh, to uh, expanding the Model S business, to getting the Model X, which is derived from the Model S, our SUV, XUV, on the road uh, by the end of the year, hopefully. And then uh, we're doing some of the preliminary design work on the uh, um, uh, on the Generation 3 vehicle, and uh, hopefully we'll have something to show for that uh, uh, the year after next. Yeah, well, we'll uh, I'll take a look at that. One of the worries which everybody has, 
if you're starting to do hundreds of thousands of electric car and uh, that 18650 which your battery you're using it's almost impossible to, to get those delivered the, the, it's the, the total capacity of all the batteries won't be enough to satisfy the tesla hunger how are you going to do that well i should say first of all that um, you know we're technology neutral and form factor agnostic so Right now, we're, we're finding that the 18650 cell form factor is, is ideal for what we're doing and for the foreseeable future will continue to be. You're right. Um, going out a couple of years, the supply chain is going to be constrained, and so we're already making investments in that area ourselves. Uh, one of my business development efforts is focused on ca of how, <coughs> excuse me, should and how Tesla uh, perhaps enters into that business ourselves. Elon has announced that we'll be developing a gigafactory uh, for developing cells ourselves. And uh, in fact, we already are using cells we designed ourselves. It's just Pan Panasonic is manufacturing them for us. And uh, you know, it's the next logical step for us to go into the manufacturing, particularly because uh, right now we ship cells from Japan uh, to the United States to be assembled and then the cars come over to Europe. That's not very efficient. So we need to have a closer, more domestic supply of cells. And, and uh, so we're looking to do that and start get that business started in the new year. At the moment, in terms of communication, everybody loves Tesla. You know, you're, you, you cannot do wrong and everybody loves the product, everybody loves the car. One car sells 10 more cars. What you normally see at companies which are so popular with everybody, at a certain point it, uh, there, there is a tendency to go, oh my gosh, and then, and then they're going to focus on everything negative. You know, a little bit you could see with the fire, but it was only a little. How are you going to prepare when everything goes so well? How are you going to prepare for also the tough times when things are coming, how do you do that emotionally? Uh, you know, it partly is ex it's experience managing your own emotions when, you know, as sometimes happens, uh, the public decides that for a period of time they want to uh, critique rather than applaud. Um, but we try and keep it uh, very real. You know, we're very pragmatic about what we're doing. We try and be very honest and straightforward about how we're doing it. Um, we're not, uh, I, I, I hope that we're not perceived as excessively hyping anything. And I think if you're realistic with people and if, you, um, if you're uh, realistic as you create expectations and you fulfill your expectations, then, then the, uh, the market uh, tends to treat you well over the course of time. It's not what's happening today that's important. <coughs> that's a snapshot in time. It's what's happening over the period of time. And in the car business, uh, the time horizons are more extended than most businesses. So we, take, we try to take the long view. You've seen uh, how that happens in Iraq when you go there with all kinds of good intention and good reasons how everything can go against you. Will that help you, uh, that experience? Yeah, no. I, I think that, that that's one analogy I probably wouldn't compare uh, the Tesla experience to. Um, yeah, I'd just leave it at that. Um, but, you know, as when you start out any business, and particularly when you're essentially starting a new industry, which is what we're doing, or a new segment of an existing industry, there are a lot of growing pains. Um, you know, it's, it energizes one to disrupt an industry and to do some, to new novel things, especially when there's a strong sense of mission. And the mission is bigger than just growing a business and, and making money, mm -hmm. which Tesla is. I mean, Tesla is, much, is about much more than the business itself. And that is really, truly and deeply felt by people. And so, you know, as long as you attach yourself to that, I mean, the primary question I ask people uh, when they're interviewing with me to join Tesla is, why do you want to do this? You better have a damn good reason in your mind. I mean, there's got to, and it's got to be something other than you love cars or you want to make money or anything like that, because at the end of the day, this is too damn difficult. And you really have to have a deep, I don't care what it is. I don't care whether it's climate or oil or you, you know, maybe it is a love of cars or a love of electric vehicles, but you got to have something that you're really, really devoted to um, uh, because this is too hard otherwise. Uh, Has it been tough? Yeah, it's been very hard. But it's also been very fulfilling, as, as, uh, as good things are. Good things are, you know, fulfilling things are hard, um, but uh, you get a deep sense of appreciation when you, when, you make, when you start to succeed. Thank you. Enjoy your ski vacation uh, in Switzerland. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, no.